Hello, welcome to my video sample for my presentation on the topic of career management and professional development. This is uh, one of my favorites and I have had a little bit of difficulty cutting it down for this sample because I uh, like so much of these topics I, I didn't know what to eliminate so it's going to be uh, a bit busy but I'll try and keep the sample as succinct as I can. Um, this is also related to my uh, another one that I have that is career advice for young professionals. It, it draws, that one will draw somewhat on this, but it's even more suited towards uh, future or recent graduates because it will have, um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about more about the transition from an academic environment to a professional environment. But this one is uh, a little bit more general uh, towards any career. So let's get started. Uh, I've split it, the sample into several areas. The first one is identifying your goals. It's sort of figuring out what you want to accomplish with your career. The second one is mapping what you want to do with your career. That's sort of setting the direction, figuring out how to get there, how to get to where you want. Um, and the last one I've got up here is development, which is how you advance your skills along the way to help you. So these aren't necessarily sequential. They're, they're related. You want to start out with what you think you want to do and then map it out, but you might learn some things along the way and need to develop some skills and then feedback to whether or not you're really on track. And I'll even put one more little bonus on here. I've got a couple of words of encouragement for professionals uh, at the end as well. So first of all, let's take a look at identifying the goals, figuring out basically what you want to do with your life uh, from a professional perspective, and also some of your personal priorities. The, the five most important things that I've put up here, and I sort of put these in a circle because they all, they're all interrelated, they need to fit. Um, the first one is you've got to uh, identify what your skills are, what you offer, and make sure that that fits in the requirements of the job. And I, you should notice I've separated these into, uh, these are the things that you yourself, the individual has, and these are things that are sort of external to you that you can't necessarily control. So the job requirements might be uh, innate, uh, and you might, uh, w when determining whether or not those skills fit, you don't necessarily get to decide what skills are required for the job. And the other thing that you as an individual are going to have are interests and priorities. And I kind of uh, debate whether these should be separate or together. I've got them together in this iteration. The interests are the things that you uh, find personally interesting. It might be the product or service. It might be the industry. It might be the function. I'm really interested in numbers, so I like, and I like analytical things, so I want to be a, a business analyst or, or a, a scientist versus I, I'm a people person, I like to sell. Um, so those might be your interests, and those can also stem somewhat from your skills. We tend to like the things that we're better at, and also your priorities. Uh, do I want to, uh, you know, am I fine with working 80 to 100 hours a week? Am I motivated by money? Or am I looking for a balance with a, a family life or a personal life? Or am I interested in feeling a strong commitment to my community and doing something that feed, feeds back to my community? We'll talk a little bit about those in a minute. So those are the individual, and they have to fit with your requirements. And, and again, if your priority is a lot of free time and family time and flexible work schedule, uh, something that has a, a very high demand for your time or very uh, strict demands on your time wouldn't wouldn't fit that. The second one that I like to talk about here on, on the external factors side is the requirement, uh, pardon me, the opportunity. And the opportunity is, you know, whether or not this field is growing or shrinking, is it large or is it small, is it competitive or non-competitive? And I, I like to say you can't, you shouldn't define your career by that necessarily. But, you know, if you're interested in an industry that is shrinking, it will be a significant headwind in you because they're, they're looking to get rid of people. They're not looking to bring people on. So it raises the bar of competitiveness there. And uh, uh, I personally have had some issues there. If you look at some of the things I'm interested in, I like, I'm an American who likes the auto industry and the auto industry has been in decline for most of my professional life. Um, you can still get a job there. I did work there, but it was a significant headwind. And uh, likewise, if you're in a boom area or a boom era, uh, that can be a significant tailwind. And the last factor, which is unfortunately one you can't control, is luck. But I always like to point out that, look, y you know, even if you've got all the right things in place and your plan makes a lot of sense, sometimes it's just a matter of being in the right place at the right time. You can't expect to be Mark Zuckerberg. 
yes, he's a skilled person who hit on a great opportunity, but there were also other co companies in social networking, and uh, to a certain extent, there was a lot of luck involved at being uh, just having just the secret formula there. Now let's talk about some of, let's elaborate a little bit on interests and priorities, because I think those are very, uh, one of the most important things and one of the areas where a lot of mistakes are typically made. First of all, when you talk about interests, a lot of people start out with, the products and services is their interest. They want to go to work making or providing the service or product that they personally like in their personal life. For example, you know, I like cars, so I want to be in the auto industry. Now, a lot of people are, I, I find film really interesting, so I want to make movies. A lot of that is, uh, a lot of people are very successful in doing that. Um, but it's, I also like to get people to think a little bit outside. Sometimes it's not just the product or service that makes you happy, it's the role. If you find that you really like selling, it's better to have a great sales job even if the product or service isn't something that you find particularly glamorous or have an interest in. Because, uh, th that, and that'll open up your opportunities. So for example, if you're great at sales, selling toilet paper is not a particularly glamorous product, but everybody uses it. And, and so if there's a dream job in, in that sales area, that might be something you should consider. Don't limit yourself to this product or service. You know, I've always found that when you go to a college campus and ask business majors, a lot of the male business majors, you say, what do you want to do? Well, I want to own a bar. Or you ask a, a lot of the female business uh, majors what they want to do, and they say, I want to be a buyer for a department store. And that's because a lot of college guys like hanging out at a bar, and a lot of college women like shopping. But there's several problems with that. They're focused very intently on the product or service. They're not necessarily focused on the role. And if you can elaborate a little bit about that, or that, that, lead me, that leads me to my next point, which is the difference between fun and fulfillment. A lot of uh, people, especially young people, tend to focus on the things that they, that they personally enjoy in their interests. And in the longer term, the research has showed us that people tend to find fulfillment more important. For example, uh, the, the, the men who like to own bars because they like hanging out at bars, that's a lot of fun when you're young and single, but if you have a family, it's a lot of late nights and weekends and, and uh, a lot of time away from your family. And, and focusing on the fulfillment, uh, in, in, in the long-term fulfillment especially, is a better career path. And the last point I want to talk about leads, uh, uh, leads back to these priorities, and frankly, it talks about a mistake that we oftentimes make. Typically, especially in business majors, we think that one of our priorities should be money. But if you look at a lot of research that's been done around the world, you'll find that money is actually a poor determinant of financial success. Uh, pardon me, a poor determinant of happiness, fulfillment, and satisfaction. For example, a lot of poor countries in Africa uh, have, have been studied and found out that they're actually no less happy than a lot of people here in America where we have significantly greater material wealth. Now that's not necessarily true if you're a war-torn country or if you're uh, starving, but, even but if, you're, if you have a certain level of stability, money is actually a poor determinant of satisfaction. And what the research has shown us is, uh, especially in the long term, the things that people tend to find most fulfilling as a priority is uh, whether or not the work that they perform is being a contribution, if they're helping people, making a contribution to their community, which is not something that they prioritize, uh, we prioritize when we're young necessarily. Um, and also it's the quality of our relationships. Those tend to be much more important to us than money. And there's also something that I call status. Having the respect of our peers, um, being, being in a job that's valued by society, also tends to be more important than money, not quite as much as contributions and relationships. So I always like to illustrate this to help set priorities. The next thing I'd like to talk about is, okay, so we've got an idea of what we want to do with our lives. How do we do that? And, and that requires a little bit of career mapping. And it's important to note that as you decide, uh, as you make your plans, one of the things that you should bear in mind is you can usually only change one thing at a time in your career. Uh, so, for example, if, you wanna, if you're uh, working in sales in a certain industry, at a certain company, and all of a sudden you want to work in finance in another industry, another company, maybe even another country or geographic area, um, that can be a very difficult transition to make because you're unproven in, that, in all of those areas. So usually if you're, if, you're gonna, if, you, if you're a salesman in one industry and you want to be a marketer in another industry, you first have to make this transition at the same company, at the same industry, from sales to marketing, and then you make the transition from, 
uh, marketing at one company to marketing in another and then you, or, or another industry. So there's usually a sequential step that you have to make and that's something to bear in mind as you make your plans. The, the next one is I want to emphasize the interrelationship between these three categories I have up here and that's that you usually learn by steps. So for example, even if you have a master plan graduating from college with what you want to do with your life, not everybody does, but if you do, you might find out as you move along and make these steps one at a time that maybe the skills you thought you had um, and that are required in your position, you're actually not as good at those things as you think you are. And one option is you try and develop those skills. And the other option is you try and find a different position that's a better fit. So that's the relationship between these. And I want to make it clear that we oftentimes learn by steps. Sometimes people stick too too strictly to their original plan and fail to recognize that um, they should broaden themselves maybe thinking less product product services and more about the roles if they broaden their perspective they'll find there's actually other things that they will be more successful at and uh, the next point under mapping is to remember that certain organizations have paths and uh, that can be uh, a, a, a significant he uh, tailwind if you if your path tends to correspond uh, if all the the requirements and the steps tend to fit your industry or sometimes even specifically your company and the other thing you might want to uh, consider is whether or not uh, what the risks are of deviating from that path maybe that path doesn't suit you you want to try something else but that might create more headwind as you try and advance if you're trying to climb the ladder and the last point I want to make is you got to decide which kind of organization you want to work for. Some of them have certain functions that they value. I used to work in the auto industry and the stereotype there was General Motors was run by the, fi the finance people were the ones who got put in charge and um, the Ford is run by the marketers. The marketing people tended to get the top spots and at Chrysler the engineers tended to get the top spots. Um, some other things to consider about which organization to choose you know, do you, want to, do you want to go to one of the large academies? Because a lot of people like to hire managers out of a company like GE because they're good for developing managers. But there's a trade-off there. Um, a lot of smaller organizations will give you more responsibility, but they will be less well-known. So that's the kind of thing you want to do. Show you a small company, large company, startup, privately owned, publicly owned, academy. Um, also, if you go to a company that is a challenger, it will be difficult because you'll generally have less resources if you're challenging the industry leader rather than going to the academy that is the industry leader. But you might learn a lot more creativity there because a lot more creativity is required. Whereas if you're in the leader in the industry and you have significant economies of scale, you might be uh, able to coast a little bit on your laurels and that might underdevelop you. And that leads us to our conversation about development. I want to talk about first, uh, I, I want to talk about a common mistake that we make when we're doing our own self-evaluation. This is a self-awareness issue. We tend to, in ourselves, we tend to attribute success to our skills. If we do something well, that's because we're really good at it. But we tend to attribute our failures to externalities. Well, it's not my fault. I, you look who I was working for and look who I was, uh, yeah, yeah, who knew that the market was going to do that. And, and what I would like to do is just point this out to make you a little self-aware of this so that if you catch yourself doing it, you can step back and say, well, now, wait a second. Was that success really because of how great I am? Or was that just an unexpected, uh, do we have an unexpected tailwind? And conversely, um, if, if I failed, is that due to something out of my control? Or was there really something that I did differently and I should, I should take responsibility for, for fixing that in myself? It's also important to note out note that we oftentimes reverse this in other people. So we think that if we succeed, it's because of our skills. But if our rival, our, our office rival succeeds, that's because, you know, they just knew the right guy or they got lucky, they were in the right place at the right time. And, co and conversely, failures in others, we tend to say that's because they didn't have the skills requ required. So that's a, that's a self-awareness point. I want to talk a little bit about how to, how to think about um, skills and what you have. I think the best kind of skills to have are intuitive. These are, you know, over here in your individual skills. These are kind of the things you're born with. Some people are natural born 
people, uh, nat very good with people. Some people are very politically savvy. Some people are really smart analysts, but those aren't necessarily, so, so the, the intuitive is usually the most powerful. And that's important because even if you're learning a skill and you're getting better at it, the people who are intuitive are usually gonna be better than you because they've been thinking of it all, because their, their brain is wired in that direction. And, some, uh, and that, that brings us to the second type of skill I want to talk about. This is your level, so I put intuitive at the highest, um, is the skills that need development. Oftentimes you start out somewhere in mid-pack, but you want to develop yourself to a high level. But that's going to require some self-awareness. First, you have to learn what you, you're not good at. Um, you also have to recognize that it's a requirement of the job. And then you've got to set a path, maybe some mentorship, um, or maybe just being aware and, and practicing it on a daily basis. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is, you know, I've sort of put the, the develop skills, uh, giving you some semblance of skill, but not to the high level you want to be at. But there's also something where you have a skill that you're lower at. And oftentimes it's very difficult to get to the top level if it's some, something that's just not in your nature. But I always like to say, I think this is a little bit of an overlooked point, and this is good for you managers to recognize in other people. Even if they're not necessarily good at something, uh, you can, if you can't bring them up to being excellent, you can at least bring them up to being functional. And the things that they are good at that are required in their job will, will help them out. So don't write somebody off just because they're not, don't, don't refuse to help someone or don't refuse to develop a skill because you, you don't have it. Maybe we can get you to the point at where you're at least functional even if you're not a leader. And then the last point I want to talk about is skills that you're lacking and, and don't seem capable of getting there so far from what you're in, from your intuition. It's difficult. And that, that should prompt a couple of questions. The first one is, is this the right fit for the job? Do I have the right job that I'm looking for? Because uh, my skills don't seem to meet the requirements. But I also encourage people not to get too easily frustrated. Try and think creatively. For example, if you're a, a brilliant scientist, but it, it's hard for you to function in a corporate environment because you're so disorganized, give that person uh, a secretary, an assistant. Give them someone to compensate for what they're lacking. And sometimes you'll see partnerships become very uh, uh, synergistic in this regard because uh, you know one person is is the the mad scientist and the other person is a level-headed business person and they work well together so don't necessarily say that because that type of job is bad for you you can't find a way to make it work maybe there's someone else that can help you and the last thing I want to talk about is encouragement uh, this is sort of as close as I get usually to a motivational speech but um, I, I oftentimes hear about people mid or late career who say, you know, well, it's so hard, you know, I'm, I've already got this job and my pension's vested and so on. And I, I like to tell people, it's never too late to have a meaningful life. If you've found a career path in here that maybe early on your priorities weren't right and that there's something else that would be more fulfilling, don't necessarily write it off. However, I'm not realistic about, unrealistic about this. I know it gets harder to change as you go on in your career. Um, there's, first of all, oftentimes because you're changing one thing at a time, you might have to take a step back. You might have to take a salary cut. You might find it hard if you want to really do something different with your life to do it immediately. And as you get older, it's harder to change. Also because you personally have difficulty changing. If you've had a career and you've decided it's not the right fit, but you're egotistically satisfied with it, you're recognized as being good at it, it's, it's difficult for you psychologically to change, not just the the, 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 the inherent position itself. And the last thing I want to always say, uh, most people will not figure all of this out the first time. They won't figure it out early. And I think that's particularly important because if you look at our popular culture, it, we glamorize the, the people who do figure it out early. We, we glamorize the Mark Zuckerbergs. Um, Steve Jobs said famously at, uh, when he was giving a Stanford commencement address, he said, I was very lucky to figure out uh, what what I wanted to do with my life early in life and I think that really showed a lot of self-awareness on his part because most people who uh, not not everyone who tur who picked right the first time realizes that they're fortunate they just think that they're smart and I think he realizes how how unusual that is and and so remember if you see everybody uh, else uh, in your peer set in your age group they're they're reaching the top of their profession earlier than you don't necessarily compare yourself to the, the furthest, the, far, the fastest. Um, find your own path and um, recognize that you're actually with most people if, if, if you didn't 
get it right the first time. So anyway, that's, that's a summary of my presentation on career management and professional development. I hope you found this interesting. If you would like to have this presented, please contact me for a proposal, and I look forward to doing business with you. Thank you.